For years in this country, presidents after presidents, governments after governments have made the efforts of, you know, instituting what we call productivity-based economy. So a production economy will help the country protect its currency. In Ghana here, the currency we use is the city. And the city obviously competes with a lot of currencies outside or international currencies. Of course, leading those currencies are the CD, sorry, the dollar, the pound, and the euro. Even when you go to Dubai, Dubai's currency, actually, is, is more <laughs> stronger or is stronger than the Ghana city. And sometimes you hold Dubai money in your hands, that, and then you hold CDs in your hands. You realize that just a few notes of that currency actually, uh, it makes a lot of notes that Ghana actually uses. So this afternoon, we'll be discussing what we can do as a country to show up our city or protect the city or make it stronger. We have also have had governments who have tried implementing uh, or, you know, doing away with what we call dollarization, where we have leaders who have come out to you know, uh, kick against the dollarization of every financial transaction that we do in a country. So you go to hotels, they charge in dollars. You go to shops, they charge in dollars. You go for some services, they charge in dollars. A lot of activities go on in Ghana, it is charged in dollars. Uh, but we fail to, you know, pay attention to those activities, which are some of the things we can do in protecting the city. What are we getting wrong in Ghana? Good afternoon, Ghana is going to serve you with a discussion of, uh, of this issue. We will have um, uh, Daniel uh, Osabute with us to talk about this. Uh, he is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Business at uh, Accra Technical University. We'll also have uh, Paul Frimpon, who is a CCIA economist and uh, an investment analyst to help discuss this issue. Also, Professor John Gachi will also be with us. Uh, on this discussion. My name is Ania Fompofo. Thank you for joining me once again. Give me some few minutes, I'll be back, and then we kick, we kick start the chat. Welcome back. It's, it's good afternoon, Ghana. My name is Anya Fompofo. So I told you earlier on that we want to discuss the issue of the city. It has been uh, a point of, uh, you know, discussion for some time now. The, the truth of the city is that the city only reacts and responds to the activities of the country or a particular country is in question. So if the Americans are talking about the dollar, it, it only responds to the economic activities of the people of America. If the British talks about the pound or the Europe, uh, maybe uh, talks about euros, it is the economic activities of these states or countries that the city is going to respond to. What are the activities of Ghana that makes our city respond the way it always responds and how it uh, competes with other currencies elsewhere. We'll give you uh, a slice on how the city has depreciated uh, from September 2021. So let's get the slides on. So the slides indicates that uh, the city depreciation 2021 to 2022 September it depreciated by 1.8%. In October, it depreciated by 2.4%, which was obviously an increase to September. It depreciated in November uh, by 1.8%. In December, and I'm, I'm giving you figures from 2021, in December, 1.7%. January is 5%. February is 4%. 0.7%. This is a rate of, de of depreciation. Now, uh, remember that the government has indicated that this particular government, I mean, it has said that, that the, the, the depreciation rate um, has slowed down, and which is why uh, they think that this government is actually performing well. Dr. Baumia says that if the, if the depreciation in your currency uh, if there is depreciation in your currency, you cannot jump 
to the conclusion that the fundamentals are weak. This is uh, a bit of a different statement that he, he made uh, previously going forward into the election uh, 2016. We'll give you more details on, on that. But I think, uh, we, okay, so, so we have been joined uh, by Paul Frimpong, who is the, an economist and an investment analyst uh, to talk to us about what we have put on the table today to discuss. Thank you, Paul, uh, for joining me. It's been, it's been years. I hope you're doing well. Hello, Paul. Uh, if you can unmute your mic. Yes, you're... yes. okay, I can hear you now. Right, Happy New Year. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. Yes, it's been a while. Yes, I trust you're doing well. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. So let me have your opening remarks on uh, the CD and its depreciation. Uh, but first, let me ask you about Dr. Baumier's, um, you know, statement. And then you can go into the CDs and its rate of dep depreciation. Uh, he has said again that if there is depreciation uh, in your currency, then you cannot jump to the conclusion that the fundamentals are weak. And we already know the argument that Dr. Balmier has made about fundamentals being weak uh, going into election 2016 and some of the economic analysis he was making to, to the people. What would be your opening uh, you know, comments on what we, we're discussing now? Uh, well, uh, on that, I think... Um to an extent, uh, it's a yes. It's not uh, a foregone conclusion that because uh, because the depreciation of, of a currency uh, is not only subject to what is happening uh, locally in the economy, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is happening uh, in all parts of the world. So if you, if you look at the situation, uh, so there, there are some uh, external factors that if they are present, then then you might ask a possible cause of your currency depreciation, but not necessarily because of something wrong that you've done uh, in your local economy. So I think that is where I will agree with him. And again, uh, looking at what is happening, of course, as you say, we'll go deeper into it. I think uh, with him, uh, looking at the current situation that we find ourselves, I believe that it's a self-inflicting um, and, and a bit of lack of discipline that has brought us to this level. So we have a very big role, uh, we play a very big role in what is happening to our currency and now. But if he earlier on said that if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. And then he comes back to say, if the depreciation in your currency, uh, uh, if there is depreciation in your currency, you cannot jump to the conclusion that the fundamentals are weak. How? economically uh, sensible, for want of better expression, does this make? Because it's still the exchange so, rate so, we're talking about here. Yeah. From, from, from the onset, from the onset, if you're, so, so we, we, run, we run what we call the floating exchange rate uh, system. So the floating, under the floating exchange rate system, the value of a country's currency is determined uh, by forest markets vis-a-vis -vis demand and supply. So you can either be on, you can be on either side. So uh, whether there's pressure on you in terms of demand or there's pressure on you in terms of supply in respect to uh, major trading currencies. That is what is being used to, to do business. In that extent, I believe that um, his first statement that if your fundamentals are weak, the depreciation and some of these uh, you know, outcomes will expose you is very much valid because that is the, 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 the fundamental issue. You have so many things going wrong 
in the management of your local economy so much so that consistently you are experiencing a depreciation in your in your in your in your currency that first statement is more valid than this second one that he's making but then again like i said possibly uh it could that we find in all Okay, so uh, we're speaking with Paul Frimpong, who is an economist and investment analyst uh, via Zoom. I think we're having challenges with uh, his line a bit. So we're talking about the CD and its behavior uh, within the economy on Good Afternoon Ghana today. And we're looking at the activities that we are undertaking, uh, which is affecting um, the performance of the CD. Um, Paul, I'm sorry, we lost you for a bit. So if you can just uh, go uh, a few sentences back to what you were saying, and then we can get you clearly. Oh. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, I, I can hear you. I can hear you. First, yeah, I was saying earlier that his first statement that uh, when the fundamentals are weak, yeah. these issues will expose you is valid any day, any time. As just opposed to the second statement that he has made. Right. Because... Like I did the local uh, activities, the local management of the economy has a bigger role to play in how your currency performs. We understand that at a point, just like what we've been experiencing the last uh, two, three years because of the COVID, uh, things could get out of hand beyond your possible control. And therefore, when such happens, obviously, uh, one cannot fully blame you for the, the economic hardship that you'll be experiencing. So, and that is not something that keeps happening. We see that the COVID just happened. Uh, of course, we saw the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. All of it, at that point, we experienced a very currency. So those things are not things that constantly happen. But if you have a situation where consistently your currency has been depreciated, then that means your economic fundamentals are rather weak. That is why you are experiencing such depreciation. So, but in this case, uh, as a country, uh, okay, so coming back to say that the, the, if the depreciation, if there's depreciation in your currency, it, it does not necessarily mean you can jump into the conclusion that the fundamentals are weak. Um, maybe economically you can accept that assertion, but relating it to economic activities in Ghana, can we go by that? Because for Ghana, maybe our economic fundamentals uh, are different and, and definitely cannot qualify to go with this uh, economic statement made by him. You, I don't think... Um, okay, we're really, really struggling to, uh, um, you know, get a stable um, flow with Paul or on the line. You're watching Good Afternoon Ghana. We wish we can have uh, a very constant, uh, you know, uh, transmission so that we can get exactly what he's uh, making. And then we we'll go also into uh, the discussion of what Ghana uh, produces, the difficulty in us uh, capturing the power of production. We've had the president make a few comments just uh, yesterday about Ghana's minerals and how we are even trying to make empower the locals so that we can compete internationally. Instead of exporting the raw material, we will rather you know, process this into finished products and then we can um, you know, exports that finished product, and that also will contribute to the power and the strength in the economy. Uh, we'll, we'll go for a break. When we come back, we'll see if we can establish him back, and then we can continue with the discussion.
Welcome back. You're watching Good Afternoon Ghana with me, Annie Fompofo. So we're talking the city against uh, the dollar and other currencies as well, of course, uh, the pounds, the euros, even the dirham, as I earlier on indicated. Uh, we've been joined uh, on the uh, phone by uh, Professor John Gachi, who is the Dean of University of Cape Coast. And Paul has also joined us again as we started a discussion with him. Paul, are you, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. Annie. Okay, I can I can hear you clearly now. I, I hope your reception is 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 good. You make make the same you were making before I go to uh, Professor John Gachi. Yes, yeah, so I was telling. So so I I was actually saying that if you say that economically we can agree with Dr. Baumia on this point that if there, 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 there's depreciation in your currency, it does not necessarily mean that uh, your fundamentals are weak. And I'm saying that. Uh, well, if you pick Ghana as an example, can we say the same thing, that our fundamentals are not weak? Yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I, I'm listening to you. Okay, sure. So, as I was saying earlier, I obviously, I'm not connected. We, can be, we have to be held accountable for, and I think it's quite, you know, uh, become a rhetoric now about what we know we are supposed to do, uh, yet we are not doing, and hence we are where we find ourselves. So that statement, uh, to some extent, cannot hold. Like mm -hmm. I said earlier, the first statement that when your fundamentals are weak, mm -hmm. some of these uh, effects will expose you is valid anytime, uh, anywhere. Uh, the issue that it doesn't necessarily mean that your fundamentals are weak, mm -hmm be held in, in, in contest. As I said by mentioning earlier, uh, we are dealing with uh, what the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, in 2007-2008, we had a global financial crisis. Uh, these are things that when they happen, uh, at a point, irrespective of how strong you are uh, in terms of managing your local economy, you will still be exposed to some level of risk, uh, which can lead to the disposition of your currency. So, uh, if there's a contest to what he said, uh, then we can appreciate the fact that it does not necessarily mean that your fundamentals are weak. But like I said earlier, on the onset, mm -hmm. if your fundamentals are weak, you are always at risk of exposing your currency uh, to the level of depreciation that we are seeing now. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, let me go to Professor John Gachi. Prof, thank you for joining us again. Good afternoon. Um, so... In my discussion with, with Paul, I just raised the quotes by Dr. Baumia that if uh, there is depreciation, he said this recently, that if there is depreciation in your currency, it does not necessarily reflect that your fundamentals are weak. But we know that, uh, you know, prior to election 2016, he said that if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. Um, for the purposes of this dis discussion, what are these fundamentals we are referring to that on a daily basis, whenever we are making this economic analysis, There's we mention the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. What are some of these fundamentals that reflect the performance of our city? Thank you very much. Uh, we can talk about the fundamentals uh, by looking at first your productive structure mm -hmm. of the economy, mm -hmm. uh, what you are able to do in terms of how much you produce, how much you consume, and how much of that you export. Uh, that will also have a reflection on your uh, international reserves. Uh, then you can also talk about whether your economy is able to generate sufficient jobs, then you can also look at your your growth. Uh, these are fundamental issues. Then you can also look at your fiscal management. And all these things will have effect on the performance of your currency. But I must quickly indicate that the performance of the currency of a country depends on multiple and sometimes complex factors. Uh, what happened before uh, Dr. Baumia made that statement was to disregard the influence of international factors that influence uh, the performance of the currency. 
So what he was trying to do is to indicate that it doesn't matter whether uh, you at that time, all your key commodities have their prices going down significantly. Your oil moved from around $93 per barrel to around $40 per barrel within a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was saying that that does not have any effect of the, on, of the, on the currency. He was saying that uh, uh, when your production sector within the mining environment almost closed down, uh, that you are not producing gold to catch up with the prices in the market, it will not have any effect on the performance of your currency. So I think he was going too deep into politics. Uh, that was why he made that statement. But the level at which your currency will have a negative effect on your economy must be measured because generally depreciation is supposed to increase your international taxes because when all those things are value at the port in dollars and your currency depreciate against that the amount of money you are going to get in terms of revenue should also go up if there is depreciation and you are key on export you should be gaining but that is not the structure we have so I think that if we want to take Dr. Baumia's word as a yastic to discuss the economy today, that will be misleading because he was wearing um, a political, uh, political cloth and uh, he just wanted the people to know that, yes, certain development were uh, in place, uh, mostly they were international in nature. And then we also have our own challenges within. But disregard those things. If you are managing the economy well, the currency will be stable. That was the political statement he was making. But we do know that the quantum of interest payment can disable uh, the performance of your currency. So if you have huge um, loans denominated in foreign currency, it means you must pay the interest of those loans in foreign currency that can put pressure. If you have an investment environment that allows that uh, benefit can be transferred at will to those who brought in capital to manage those companies in the country, uh, it can have effect on your, on, on, your, on your currency. If you are importing basic things like agriculture produce that you should have been producing yourself, definitely, you will use foreign currency and they will have effect. Then there are some development that can take place in the international market. Uh, for example, if there is a, a challenge uh, between uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe, and the rest of the West, and that influence how much crude oil is put on the market, that will determine prices and those prices can also have effect on the way currencies are managed. So I think they are complex matters and uh, which we need to identify. Some of them, we have ability to deal with them. For example, if you have realized that your import bill, a chunk of it is coming from the importation of agricultural produce, things like tomatoes. The question you ask yourself is, what agricultural policy do you put in place to ensure productivity uh, in the area of tomatoes and those basic things like ginger that we are importing from our neighboring countries and we are not spending or using the same currency with. So these are issues you can deal with. If you are borrowing excessively for which you need to transfer a lot of money in dollars to pay, uh, I, I, I believe these are issues you should take decision to, to control. Uh, so that is what I think I, I will say. But we shouldn't be misled by the statement by Dr. Baumia. It was political statement to undermine his political opponent at that time. That don't consider any uh, uh, global development. If you're managing economy well, those things will not have effect on you. Today, here we are. We have a global pandemic. Initially, when the global pandemic started, the currency was not behaving like this because we were not importing much. I mean, 
activities were almost at a halt. Now, <laughs> we are claiming that it's having effect. We know there is some development uh, in the uh, global capital market. Uh, we are saying that we should recognize that. So it, it doesn't match. That is where the challenge is. But the point is that there are multiple and complex factors that determine the performance of our currency. Some we have control. Then we should be questioning ourselves, those that we have control over, what are we doing about those factors? Yeah, yeah. Then I we mean, leave the international mm -hmm. factors that we don't have any control over. So, so solution is, is quite needed. What, what, what are some of the areas? I was just looking at, I mean, areas that we have control over. I was looking at um, um, some of the weaknesses, which is, uh, you know, our rates of borrowing. We have to even be servicing our debts uh, when they mature. We cannot, you know, uh, do anything about it, but we're supposed to, you know, uh, go by what it says. We don't have enough revenue generation sources. We are not able to produce to meet demand. Uh, just yet, last year, uh, we were recording $150 million we use in importing fish. But just two days ago, His Excellency Nanado uh, made this statement on the international platform how we're using $200 million, which means it's even gone up by $50 million, to import fish uh, into the country. So we, we, we look at all these weaknesses and we have to find ways of, you know, uh, managing the situation such, such that it doesn't get out of hand. So I would like you to go into the areas where you think immediately we can do uh, to sort ourselves out. I think I provided a broad answer. Uh, it is the Ministry of Trade that should come out with them the list of items. In fact, nowadays they are not even bringing the list of items that we import Port. publicly mm -hmm. because there was a time that they, they published the list and the analysis started. It was not in the favor of those who are managing the country. So now they don't even publish. So it is the job of Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade, uh, and Pera Bank of Ghana that is interested in managing the currency to give it the list you have talked about fish, and this fish is just an omnibus statement. We have right. different type of fish. Perhaps some of them, uh, uh, our area will not be able to produce them. Let me say so. So what percentage of this $200 million uh, of fish can we produce here when we put the appropriate measures in place? So that is the policy. You see, if you look at the currency management from Bank of Ghana point of view, you have failed. If you look at currency management from only Ministry of Finance point of view, you have failed because mm. fish is not produced by Bank of Ghana. Right. So this is where uh, mm. policy collaboration is needed. So you touch on fish, uh, fish and then we have a fishery ministry. What policy have they put in place to deal with the amount of money we spent importing fish that we could have produced ourselves? Then you can go to rice. What is the percentage of rice produced in Ghana as opposed to the percentage imported? Mm -hmm. Do we have policies in place to increase the percentage that we are producing? Do we have policy in place to encourage consumption of what we produce in Ghana? Do we have policy in place to ensure that we support the rice farmers so that when they produce and package, the price of made in Ghana will be less than the price of uh, made in Vietnam and Thailand and co that we bring into the country. These are broad policy coordinations that can help uh, provide some respite to the currency with time. Uh, so we can go on. In fact, I'll do, I also do know that we are net importers of uh, palm oil. We are net importers of uh, some agricultural produce. So we can name them onion, etc. Chemicals. Net importers of palm oil. I, I didn't know that. Yes, you can check it. <laughs> <laughs> right. see, so these are these are the issues. So if we have the list, then the government will not take them one by one. Which one do we think that look, this thing is shameful to be importing them? 
what policy do we put in place for their production and consumption in the country? By the moment you are thinking about managing your currency, because Bank of Ghana will tell you that we have this uh, uh, level of international reserve, and then we will pump this amount of dollars into the to system, the system right. to push it in the red. That is not how it is done. Hold on there. Let me go to Paul. Uh, and, and I like what you ended. You said it's not how it's done. Paul, the, the, the pumping of dollars into the system to show up the city has been repetitive. It's not something that uh, it's surprising that uh, Dr. Gachi is saying that. It's not how it's done. But every government source of does that. Why, why is that so? I think it, it's mostly because of um, uh, the, the fact that we want to provide uh, more of um, you know, short-term uh, solution mm -hmm. whilst we plan on our medium to long term. All right. So as a government, as managers of the economy, uh, their job is to engage and face every crisis as they happen head on. But first, of course, putting their foot in there to ensure that they can at least save or protect what we have whilst we are thinking about what we are going to add to uh, what we've lost or what we are going to bring back what we've lost and also increase upon it. So that is why they mostly uh, uh, try and intervene in that direction. But of course, it, it has always not been helpful. We all know that the outcomes following some of these injections, um, most of the times, instead of it being a, a sign that we have to go beyond that, and actually uh, walk the talk by introducing some of these measures that can create a very uh, you know, sustainable solution. We don't. So once we get the, the dollars pumped into the economy, we get back to being relaxed. And then in no time, we see that we are back to where we were uh, before. So I think that has been the, the challenge. So, so is there... And I think I, I, Prof were mentioning... Were mentioning a lot of he was mentioning what? Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just saying that Prof was mentioning that uh, we, 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 that has been our, our, our trajectory in terms of trying to deal with such situations. So we try to manage the currency from the central bank point of view. Of course, they have a key role to play uh, because once you're tackling inflation, there's, you have an element of currency that you're also tackling. But most of the times, that angle is not sustainable. It can help, I mean, relax the situation for a period. But whilst we are relaxing ourselves in that period, we should still be going ahead with our plan to ensure that we are at least are going to be sustainable in terms of dealing with some of these issues. So, for example, he was mentioning and we were discussing about some of the, the imports that we are, we, we, the import situation that we find ourselves. We all are aware that Ghana is an import driven uh, economy. So what we need is what we call the import substitution strategy. So we know the things that we import. Hello, am I yeah. audible? Yes, you're audible, yes. I can hear you, Paul. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm losing Paul again. Uh, Paul, can you hear me now? Okay, uh, we'll try to, to we'll try to uh, get get him back. Um, let me let me just switch to Prof, Professor Gachi. Prof, I was just thinking about um, uh, the benchmark values which we're dealing with today, and um, we want to find out if, even though we're having a bit of a tough time trying to push uh, that agenda from the government, isn't that a, a way of starting our productive productive abilities at some point where we need to focus on identifying some of these products and then try to uh, do it ourselves and reduce the extent of uh, products that we import into the country. Is, is that not a good start? Well, I think we are supposed to create an environment to help uh, domestic uh, private sector to produce uh, those items that we are importing excessively, especially those that we have the ability to do. But the question is, uh, should that policy come at the time that those private sector entities don't have capacity, they don't have the strength to do that, 
uh, that is problematic. So you only put huge fiscal burden on those who operate in the space. Those items that will be imported because you cannot replace those things within a period of two years, three years. You need to plan for them mm. and get the capacity to be able to do so. So if you come abruptly and claim that uh, you 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 that policy will immediately translate into the Ghanaian private sector taking advantage of this policy to begin to produce in the volumes, in the quality that is required uh, to, to change the import uh, to, uh, to domestic uh, consumption or usage of those items. At that one, everybody knows that it is not true. It is not possible. Remember the same private sector that we are not able to service in terms of their support uh, because of COVID. How on earth do you think that they will have the ability, financial ability, technical ability to be able to produce at cheaper cost uh, for Ghanaians to the scale of the importation that we have been doing? That policy is only in the interest of shoring up the level of revenue to mitigate the vulnerability that the indicators have shown, especially to the external people. It does, it does not mean that the intention of government is really to ensure that the Ghanaian private sector is able to produce those items that we are importing. So at what point do you think that this private sector, we can you know, hit our chest and say, well, now today we can tell that the pri private sector has the capacity, so let's now tow this, this path. Because I, I, I can imagine that maybe today government is struggling with revenue generation, which is why it will introduce uh, uh, re the reverse of this benchmark values. But uh, talking in real terms, at what point can we identify that, yes, the private sector is ready, so now we can, we can fly? I think it's an investment that we need to do over a period of time. And government have to identify the kind of investment that it ought to do uh, in the private sector of Ghana to be able to live to that expectation. Uh, one question is this. It is clear in the country that those items that we decided to produce in the country, take rice, for example, uh, so that uh, we limit the importation of rice. It is clear that when you go to the rice producing enclaves, uh, five kilo of uh, locally produced rice, well packaged, seem to be more expensive than uh, what is imported from outside, which means that there is something being done to those critical areas to produce at a cheaper cost, and they are able to export them in volumes to countries like Ghana. So if you don't put those mechanisms in place to support, uh, for example, rice farmers, you can say that you have reversed the benchmark value, but they will continue to produce at a higher cost, and they will not be able to meet the competition because you produce for a market. And so if the market prefer imported items, even with the benchmark value being reversed, the price is lower than what is produced in the country. Mm -hmm. They will continue to, to, to patronize what is imported so those are the things we should be doing. We have gotten to a point that we have uh, have uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, hatred for uh, what we call subsidies uh, for for our farmers. Right. Uh, subsidy for certain some level of productive sector. We don't do that. So those that we are competing with, those who give us the loan the exit facility and the rest, those who give us money to come and put up even uh, the development bank and the rest, they are packaged their farmers and other producing uh, areas to produce at cheaper cost. We will not be producing at cheaper cost. So it is not merely about the reversal of the benchmark value, but it's about a whole investment package into our domestic or into our local uh, uh, a private sector to be able to live up to expectation that we have not done.
Let me get back to Paul. Paul, um, investment package, you say. Paul, um, you were on the Bank of Ghana and we were talking about how they, you know, pumping dollars to show up their city. Now, whose responsibility is it to monitor and make sure that whatever is pumped into the system, we get uh, the results that we're looking for, one, and then we can recover what we have lost within the period. Whose responsibility is that? Is that? Is the Bank of, of Ghana's work uh, to pump and leave it at that? Not necessarily. Uh, so as, as I was saying earlier, uh, those measures are mostly for the, the, the short term uh, managing the situation, more like saving what we have left mm -hmm. as we prepare to uh, increase or, or grow from there on. And so that is why they introduce such a measure. Now, with respect to that, as I started by saying, as, 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 as a country, we, we all know that we are import driven. So, a clear policy strategy that we need that should be working for us, which will complement short-term intervention from the central bank, which the central bank pumping dollar into the system to be a very workable, efficient import substitution system. And I think currently what we are experiencing or what we are seeing is what we have we've seen under the Ministry of Trade as one, one, one district, one factory. For me, I think it should go beyond uh, any political lens. I think it's one of the, the major programs that we can leverage on to bridge the import gap as we are seeing now. Mm. But I said it by saying earlier, we are running a floating exchange rate system, which is about demand and supply of your currency. That will determine whether it's appreciating or depreciating. So if you have you identified that you have you have an import-driven economy, so what you introduce an import substitution strategy, which of course, like I'm saying, the typical example you can see in Ghana now is a one district one factory, which should be geared towards manufacturing uh, locally most of the things that we import. I mean, most of the things are very basic. And so we should have a plan and a strategy like the one you want and we supposed to work towards these kind of important strategy. And in that, and that is a sort of a medium to long-term solution that we can bring in to augment the short-term solution that we usually get from the central bank in pumping the, 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 the dollar. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention is that I think there's something happening across the continent of Africa that we can leverage on to ensure that we can protect our currency uh, in the medium to the long term, which is the Africa continental future area. Luckily for us, we are playing a very key role in the, in the, in the success of this. Now, recently, we launched what we call the Pan-African Payment Settlement System, the PAPS, which is pioneered by some of the uh, leading Pan-African banks. It was launched here in Accra. Now, what they sought to do, this PAPS, the Pan-African Payment Settlement System, sought to do is to ensure that all member countries that are trading on the after platform actually trade and do business in their local currency. So when you are able to successfully, and of course, there are a lot of uh, internal work that has to go on to ensure that we can leverage on this. So if we are on this PAPS system, what it means is that there wouldn't be any need for any uh, uh, importer or exporter to have to convert the local currency or purchase a foreign currency before you can do business. So that will actually reduce the pressure that is going to be on our So if I'm buying anything from someone, let's say from South Africa or from Morocco or from, or from Togo or from Nigeria, I do not need uh, a foreign currency I do not need to convert my Ghana currency to a foreign currency before I can do this business. And that actually will go a long way to reduce the pressure that we are experiencing on it. So some of these issues can really, really help us. But then again, as I said, we need to ensure that it all fits into our plan of what we are trying to do to ensure that we do not always almost rely on these short-term uh, uh, measures that we get from the central bank. As Prof mentioned, uh, managing your currency from the standpoint of the central bank is almost always not adequate and not sustainable enough. 
Yeah, we'll, 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 let me, uh, I'll, I'll send the, the, this question uh, to both you and uh, Prof Gachi, and, th and that has to do with dollarization. I mean, before that, we even have a problem already where our system obviously is not strong. You have our traders always fighting with foreign traders uh, in the way they are conducting uh, trade. And according to uh, our laws, it does not allow them to conduct a trade that way. So our traders always find themselves, uh, you know, in, in a banter. Uh, with these foreigners, even before the coming in of after. So we already have a fundamental issue to deal with uh, for our traders. Now, the issue of dollarization has also been on the table for a while, and uh, leaders pretend to be concerned and, you know, throw in cautions here and there. But they themselves are involved in the business of dollarization. How do we solve that problem? Very Thank much. you very much. Uh, that shows that we don't have the moral backing to be able to deal with dollarization. Uh, the point is that government is the worst uh, corporate corporate when it comes to dollarization. Right. In fact, government even borrows sometimes in the domestic market in dollars, dollars. or in foreign currency. Uh, so how do you go around uh, uh, trying to stop dollarization? Uh, so that's uh, it's a huge job for government to do. We cannot do that for government. I believe government uh, showed the way uh, all the citizens and businesses will follow. So it's as simple uh, as that. But you see, we cannot continue to be deceiving ourselves. This after, Ghana is not going to be the immediate gainer, mm -hmm. as the World Bank has indicated recently. Now, there are countries in Africa uh, which are doing bor borrowing rates at around 10%. Some are, some are even doing around 8%, some 12%. So you cannot be doing <laughs> about 20% borrowing mm -hmm. rate and say that you are competing with other countries uh, <laughs> to benefit uh, the way other countries will benefit. Other countries have actually invested in their SME sector. They are ready to take up the challenge, uh, the opportunities. Mm -hmm. We have not invested in the SMEs. The moment a business is established, the next thing we think about is what is the task we can get from them. Mm -hmm. We have not come to the realization that we need to invest in businesses to get the revenue we need to generate. Again, our intra-Africa trade is nothing to write home about. So why are we tickling ourselves that there is something called AFTA, or the African Continental Free Trade Area, that is now a savior? When even our record, if you ask Ghana, or you check the data, what uh, or which countries are our major <laughs> uh, trade, uh, trading partners, you will not get any African country. So that is what we need to nurture now. So the, the framework provides opportunity for us to begin to trade among ourselves. But we have not started that vigorously. So I think we should just face the issues, bring on board the roadmap to ensure our businesses are ready to participate, our businesses are willing to participate, what opportunities or what incentive do we provide for our businesses to be able to be at the forefront and let us gain from this African continental free trade area? That is very important for us to do. But I'm, I, want, I'm, I want to also indicate that when we are discussing about uh, uh, the volatility of the currency and we are focusing on import, you see, we also need to be fair to ourselves. We have different types of import. Uh, we have what we call intermediate import, mm -hmm. which we use for our industries, mm -hmm. our businesses, for production, for other activities. If we are importing intermediate goods to churn out into other products and other byproducts from that are churn out to other things, that's what people are calling the circular economy. If we do that, importation is no more a problem. 
But the point we are making is that there are many items we shouldn't be importing. Mm -hmm. And we are importing them. So those are the things we are focusing on. So we shouldn't cite import as the only factor. We are talking about import of items that we should be producing ourselves. That is one. Right. Then there are many other things outside import and export. And for the export, I don't want to talk about it because value addition is near to zero. <laughs> Expanding and diversifying the export uh, destination and, uh, and the rest, uh, meeting standards, etc., is a challenge we need to work on. So uh, institutional capacity in terms of uh, standard board or standard authority to be able to give uh, certification to our, our businesses to meet international standards that I believe those standards are also enshrined in after they are enshrined in WTO protocols, etc. How we will be able to meet those standards sustainably? We need to think about those things. We need to invest in those things, you know. Then we need to talk about institutional capacity. It is when we do these things that we are ready for business. Right, right. Uh, Paul, let me have you have the last word on that. Maybe you will also have something to say about this dollarization. And Prof Professor Gachi has mentioned a few uh, very important points. I don't know what you want to add to it before we wrap up. Yes, so my, 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 my point that I want to make is about what we call the foreign portfolio assets. So, first of all, once you are engaged in what we call foreign direct investment, once you set up a drive, you set up, you have a GIPC, which is at the center of uh, driving foreign direct investment. Okay, it's a two way street, of course. The, their job is to ensure that we get Ghanaian businesses and, and Ghanaian uh, investment in other countries. Uh, at the same time, we try to attract other foreign investment into the country, which is one of their core priorities, to project certain sectors that they think we need help. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we want to engage external uh, parties that will be interested in investing in these sectors. Now, at the end of the day, we need to have a plan for some issues like that. Because if you have a system where you, you go out there, you campaign, to promote the country that we want investors to come in. Now, at a point, we must ensure that there's a strategy that is going to ensure we, we tap into these expertise and these insights that are coming with the capital that they come to invest. So that we don't face a situation where at the end of each uh, financial year, we get most of these companies repatriating yeah. all their, yeah. their, their, their earnings back yeah. into their respective yeah. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the back of we giving them tax holidays. Exactly. So they, 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 these issues also put a lot of pressure on the local currency. At a point, it's something that you cannot entirely deal with. But like I said, there must be a conscious effort to ensure that some of these investment you know, uh, campaigns that we are running also has a strategy that ensure that most of these uh, money actually stays in the right. economy. And that's a typical example. And that is exactly what China did. So you go and invest in China, there's a limit, there's a percentage at which you can uh, repatriate your, 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 your profit, your profit out of China. Right. If they have a number of years that your investment must stay, including your earnings, before you can actually take your earnings back from China. Right. So within this period, you get to stabilize your currency without putting unnecessary pressure sure. on your currency just because you wanted to drive investment into your economy. Right. So I think right. we need to look at that uh, foreign uh, portfolio outflow issue uh, with respect to the foreign direct investment that we are seeking out there. I thank you. I thank you very much. Paul Frimpong is an economist and investment analyst. Uh, he just joined us via Zoom. And also, uh, Professor John Gachi is a dean uh, of the University of Cape Coast. Uh, and uh, he's a, a dean at the University of Cape Coast. Also joined us via Zoom on this discussion. Uh, is the city against other currencies and some of the activities they've mentioned, economic activities that we must undertake, uh, leading that activity, of course, is investment package from Professor Gachi. And also, of course, Paul also talking about how we have to limit 
repatriation. If foreigners come into the country and they work and they have to repatriate their profit, we need to put a cap on it. Most of these things we have to do to protect the city. My name is Anya Fompofo. Thank you for joining us for this one hour of what discussion of what the city is all about. Join us again uh, on Friday on Good Afternoon Ghana. Thank you for watching.